Christopher is a Wellcome Trust Sir Henry Dale Research Fellow and is also the recipient of a 2021 Lister Institute Prize Fellow at um, Newcastle University. His work seeks to understand host microbial interactions in early life and has wide implications for better understanding diet microbe host interactions with potential to develop novel disease biomarkers and targeted therapeutic interventions to promote health in preterm infants and beyond. The Fleming Prize is named after Sir Alexander Fleming, the founder and first president of the society, and is awarded to an early stage career researcher who has achieved an outstanding research record. I'm sure you all agree Christopher is an excellent recipient and he'll talk to us today about diet microbe host interactions in early life. Christopher. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much to the Microbiology Society. It's an incredible honor to be able to uh, accept the Fleming Prize and, and give this lecture uh, this evening. And really it's a reflection of the many fantastic clinicians I've had the opportunity to work with over the years, the researchers I've worked alongside, the supervisors and mentors who's guided me in my career, and now two members of my current lab who's been essential contributors to some of the work I'll talk about. And so the Microbiology Society suggested I talked a bit about my career. I'll do that instead of in a couple of slides at the beginning, rather integrating it into the presentation um, throughout. And so I'll start and spend the first half of the talk talking about my PhD and postdoctoral work, and then the second half of the talk focused on uh, my work since joining Newcastle University four years ago, which of course has been quite impacted by uh, the COVID pandemic, but I think we've been able to make some important progress despite uh, the challenges that we've all had to face. So, I, I never really planned to be an academic. I certainly never foresee myself going on to running a lab and, and being a researcher. And when I left school at 16, all my friends went off and just got a job or went to college and learned a trade. And I sort of stumbled my way into higher education and eventually into university. And it wasn't until the latter stages of my PhD, uh, my undergraduate, I got to work on a, a microbial ecology project looking at a late sediment core under the supervision of Steve Cummings, that I really got a, a taste of what doing research is about. I was in the lab, problem solving, troubleshooting, but using practical skills rather than just sitting reading textbooks and sitting in exam rooms. And I really did enjoy that aspect of the undergraduate program. When I left, Steve actually dropped me an email and said, would I be interested in applying for a PhD? Uh, no one in my family has got a PhD. I assumed that meant I had to pay more tuition fees, sit in more lectures, go through more uh, textbooks. But when I found out actually I'd be paid to do it and I'd be in the lab and, and doing the research and in this case applying the microbial ecology theory to preterm infant gut and, and health outcomes, it became a very exciting prospect. And then when I spoke to Janet Barrington and Nick Ambleton, who are neonatal consultants at the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle, uh, I really got a taste of their passion, enthusiasm, and, and determination for improving outcomes in, in the preterm infants they care for. And, and I'm glad every day that I decided to go for that PhD and was eventually awarded it. I should also say a special thank you to Andy Nelson, who's in the audience uh, somewhere this evening, who really took me under his wing from day one of my PhD, brought my science on tremendously, continues to support the lab to date, and I, believe it or not, did try to find a professional photo of us where we didn't have a pipe in our hand, but as you can see, it uh, was quite unsuccessful. So we've heard quite a bit over the last few days about the microbiome. I think you all have a pretty good understanding of what it is the environment that, uh, the uh, small community that occupies a distinct environment. So in the talk this evening, I'm gonna very much focus on the gut as the environment and on preterm infants uh, and term infants, so very much focused in early life and, and very much focused on the bacterial uh, component. And as we sit here this evening, just over half of the cells in our bodies come from our microbes and just less than half from our own human cells. When we consider that at the genetic level, over 99% of the genes encoded within the human body come from our microbes and less than 1% from our own human genome. And whilst, of course, we've studied microbes for centuries, I think the advert of molecular techniques and in particular sequencing technologies has really led a, a revolution in understanding the role that microbes play in human health. And of course, we have a great appreciation now that they play fundamental roles. And I think that's no more so true than during the early life period, in particular the first year of life. And so here's a few examples of the role of microbes in, in human health. 
And I think of, of relevance for today, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, aspects involving the immune system and, and, uh, and maintenance of gut epithelial integrity or, or barrier integrity. And when we think about a preterm infant, that becomes especially important. So preterm infants are a very unusual, very unnatural population. They're born prematurely. They're housed in neonatal intensive care, typically in sort of sterile incubators. They have uh, more likely to be born by cesarean section, more likely to receive antibiotics, and less likely to be breastfed or receive sufficient volumes of, of mother's milk. And so, of course, that's going to impart uh, and play roles in, in microbiome development, and we think that may play also roles in, in various disease outcomes. And today I'm going to be very much focused on necrotizing enterocolitis, although I'll touch a little bit briefly on, on late-onset sepsis as, as well. So this is my first ever poster presentation 11 years ago in Harrogate, the Microbiology Society, or the SGM as it was back then. And this was one of the first projects in my PhD because we had preterm stool samples. Often we had quite limited material in order to work with. And so we tried a range of different DNA extraction kits and methods, uh, testing different weights and volumes of, of stool samples. And actually, from the back of this poster and the work that I did in collaboration with uh, Suzanne Kennedy, who was at Mobio at the time, it opened up a huge door for me uh, later in, in my career during my postdoc, and I'll mention that briefly. But it's amazing to think that when you look back at these moments, you really don't appreciate what, what might become of, of some of those interactions and collaborations that you, that you make at these types of meetings. So when I'm talking about a preterm infant, I'm referring specifically to that population of infants who are born at less than 32 weeks gestation. In our cohort, that will range from 22 to 32 weeks. And so you can probably well imagine at the earliest end of that scale just how immature, how premature those infants are, both in their immune system, but also in the cells that are lining their epithelium. And this is important, especially for a disease called necrotizing enterocolitis, which I'll abbreviate to, to NEC. And so NEC is the leading cause of death in preterm infants who survive the first few days of life, and it's um, more common in the most preterm infants. So it really is a, a disease of, of prematurity and, and having that underdeveloped immune system and in intestinal architecture. And, and really, it's just an exaggerated inflammatory response. In a term infant, many of the stimuli, the microbes, and, and other components of the lumen wouldn't cause so much of an issue, but in a preterm infant, they respond in a very inflammatory fashion. This eventually leads to uh, reduced blood flow to the region of the gut, uh, leading to ischemia and eventually necrosis. So in the worst cases, those infants will undergo surgery. They'll have that necrotic portion of their bowel removed. And of course, you can probably imagine that's going to play important roles in uh, morbidity for the rest of that uh, individual's life. So maternal milk is one of the most protective factors against the onset of this disease. And of course, the gut, which is the, the center of this disease, in particular the terminal ileum, and the way the host and microbe interact is also thought to play important roles in the pathogenesis. And so my PhD really aimed to understand more about that, that microbiome development in, in preterm infants. And a huge part of, of this work has really stemmed from Janet Barrington's vision uh, 12 years ago now. And at the time of my starting PhD, Janet had collected 100 samples from preterm infants and stored them in the Great North Neonatal Biobank. And to date, Janet and her team have collected over 100,000 samples from preterm infants in Newcastle. And so, as you can imagine, for a researcher like myself, that's an absolute gold mine. And, and I've been able to use that uh, resource for uh, many of the work I'll talk about today. So those samples include things like breast milk, stools, and urines, where we aim for daily sampling. Uh, we also, where possible, collect and salvage these uh, more invasive samples. And you can see we perform a range of different omic-type uh, techniques to really understand as much as we can about uh, the, these quite precious samples. We also now use them to develop intestinal organoids from the resected tissue, and I'll talk briefly about that at the end of uh, the presentation today. So as I said, the Grey North Neonatal Biobank, a fantastic resource for researchers around the world and people in this room. If you're interested, please get in touch. We're always happy to share samples. We're always happy to share data which we've generated from the samples uh, within this biobank. So here's me in my first ever conference presentation, which again was the Microbiology Society. So hopefully you can see a bit of a theme. The Microbiology Society has been incredibly supportive of, of me and, and, and my career um, to date. And so at the time, we were doing a lot of denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis, and it's remarkable to think there'll be many people in the audience who, who don't know what that technique is, because it was the mainstay of, of microbial ecology research for, for many years before sequencing came around. And we didn't have a huge number of samples, but we were able to show, uh, anecdotally at least, that there seemed to be a difference between the microbiome or the microbial community and infants who developed NEC compared to those infants who didn't. 
We were able to get a little bit of funding towards the end of my PhD to do some sequencing. We had to focus on our, our, that uh, quite extensively, so we did it on twins. And what this is basically demonstrating is that an infant who developed disease, baby 139, you can see their diversity of their microbiome drops just before diagnosis of disease. And that's coupled to an overgrowth of, of Escherichia in, in, the, in the stool samples. And so, again, very anecdotal, but enough of a, a, a gain and a bit of evidence that the microbiome may be involved in, in this disease, or at least associated. So towards the end of my PhD and the start of my postdoc, where I was at Northumbria University, we um, had collected, by this point, a few thousand samples. So in this study, we had extensive longitudinal sampling. That's the real um, power of this study. We have only a few number of cases, so seven neck, uh, seven sepsis, matched individually to two controls. And as many in the audience will probably appreciate, when you get a microbiome data set, uh, it's quite hard to analyze at times. Traditional statistical approaches uh, may not be the most suitable. And one approach that we used back then and continue to use to date is to use a clustering algorithm to basically uh, take those 800 samples and their microbiome profiles and then bin them into a number of predefined groups that was, that was deemed optimal. So in this case, our 16S our RNA sequencing data, six clusters was determined optimal. We term these preterm gut community types. I'll largely refer to them as community types for the rest of the talk. And you can see basically how their algorithm has put samples into clusters in the way that it has. So Klebsia, they're really dominant here in cluster one, and I'll animate that here by this purple oval. And you can see that the community type would look somewhat like this. The difference, or the major difference between community types two and one is the addition of this Enterococcus being relatively abundant in, in that community type. And you can sort of begin to build this pattern of these different uh, preterm gut community types based on uh, taxonomy. And I'll draw your attention in particular to community type six here, which was dominated by bifidobacterium and was also uh, the most diverse community type. So then, of course, we've primed with this. We can now start to ask the question of how do these different community types associate with uh, disease progression? In this case, we first looked at neck, and what we found is basically no single preterm gut community type was consistently associated with the onset of neck in, in this population. But on the flip side, we did observe that community type 6, that's the high bifidobacterium group, if an infant had a sample within that community type early in their life, they never went on to uh, develop neck, and they never went on to develop sepsis. So, we don't think there's a particular causative organism in this disease, but there might be ways to modulate microbiome to, to improve outcome and, and offer protection. Another way of looking at this type of data is by ordination. You'll be, many of you will be familiar with such an approach where each dot here represents a different sample. Uh, they're colored, in this case, according to the community type. So you can see the orange here is, is, is the Staphylococcus group. You, you can see the yellow there, Bifidobacterium dominant in the middle. And I'll play an animation in a moment. You'll see a control in green and a neck infant matched uh, neck infant in, in red and how their microbiome develops over time. Each dot here represents a different microbiome profile, so the further to get, uh, apart two dots are, the more dissimilar the microbiome um, is. And so as we see the neck infant here from birth has this very chaotic development. They've moved through quite a lot of these different preterm gut community types already, from that high staph to a high Klebsiella group to high Escherichia, back to high staph. And if we contrast that with the control infant, you can see, again, they emerge from the Staphylococcus group. That's quite common in our preterm infants. We'll start with a relatively high abundance of, of staph in their guts and quickly moves into that bifidobacterium dominant community type and remains in there for the remainder of its sampling. So, Again, rather anecdotal in, 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 in a uh, matched case control here, but we did talk about this a bit in the manuscript, which is published in open access to basically say infants that went on to develop neck had less uh, bifidobacterium or relative abundance of bifidobacterium and also less stability of their uh, microbiome. So it was around this time that I moved to Baylor College of Medicine, and I mentioned earlier about uh, Suzanne Kennedy and, 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 and working with her when she was at Mobio. Um, I was on the radar. We hadn't spoken for many years at this point, but she moved to Baylor College of Medicine to join Joe Petrosino and his team and asked if I would be willing to go over and join her as, as a postdoc. And so it was really too good an opportunity to turn down. I applied for many uh, fellowships and, and grants and didn't get a single one, but fortunately Joe had um, the funds to still support my visit. Unfortunately, the visa application took so long that Suzanne had left before I, I was able to move to America. But I was still fortunate to join Joe in his unbelievable lab, particularly his computational biologist with Matt Wong uh, and Dan Smith. 
Also, Tatiana Forfanova, who I worked very closely with, to de or more of a bioengineering project to develop a, a core culture system. I'll talk about that briefly at the end today as well. And also the Mary Estes lab to develop a method for generating preterm organoids, which was a non-trivial uh, problem at the time. Our first few samples from preterm infants didn't yield any organoids, but we've since optimized this method now and have a 100% success rate in, in generating these lines uh, from preterm infants. And so my time was spent really between computational work, and I learned an incredible amount um, by spending time with uh, much smarter people than me. And I also was able to do a lot of the lab work, so these bioengineering projects, some microbiology, and some tissue culture. So, so I was able to gain skills in, in both aspects. I'm not going to talk about much of the computational stuff today, but just to mention this one study because it has set me down a path or contributed towards the path that I now work on at Newcastle. And so this is the TEDDY study. It stands for the Environmental Determinants of Diabetes in the Young study. And I take no credit for the collection of samples. That was just an incredible effort from hundreds of investigators and clinicians and researchers from three centers in America and three centers in Europe who collected tens and thousands of stool samples from thousands of, of infants at risk of diabetes. For this study, we designed a case control uh, match study. We had sequenced in the end around 12,500 stool samples from just over 900 infants. And I really landed at Baylor at the optimal time to then begin to be able to work on, on the data analysis. And what's depicted here is, of course, the teddy bear. We have an infant in the so-called security blanket of bacteria. And I hope what you can see, is, again, is those Y-shaped bifidobacterium taking center stage in, in, in that figure. And that's a bit of a spoiler for what's to come. Um, but yes, that's, that's the bifidobacterium. So we can look at microbiome, of course, in one or two ways. The first way that we uh, tend to do is, is looking at taxonomy or, or species. And then the second is to uh, care less about which species are there, but more about the genetic uh, function or, or genetic uh, capacity of, of that microbiome. So initially, I used the taxonomic data at the species level from, from this metagenome data to ask of all the things that could potentially impact microbiome development based on, on, on literature largely, which ones had the, the biggest uh, and most significant impact. And what you can probably already uh, see is that breast milk, at least over the first year of life, explained the most amount of variance and was the most significant factor driving microbiome development. Birth mode was also important, and some of these other environmental factors. After the first year of life, as you would expect, most infants have transitioned onto solid foods. Breast milk no longer has any impact on, on the microbiome. And really, by the time an infant gets to their second birthday, their microbiome has become very individualized uh, and really not perturbed by any of these current or historic events. When we then look at the functional capacity or the genetic capacity, we find that only breast milk is associated, and again, only over that first year of life. So we didn't need to spend a ton of money sequencing to be able to find out that breast milk is, uh, and breastfeeding is important. We've known for, of course, centuries that from the maternal side, there's a range of benefits from, from breastfeeding and also from the infant side. And there's a ton of fantastic epidemiological evidence now that if an infant is breastfed early in their life, they have a reduced risk of several diseases, most of which are listed here, not only in the short term, but much longer term throughout their teenage and, and adult years as well. And then bringing it back to our preterm work, in particular, late onset sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis, of course, we know if an infant receives breast milk, they're at a reduced risk of developing these diseases as well. So we then ask, well, what if breast milk is, is so important and, and how is it actually impacting uh, the microbiome specifically? And I said I had to give you a bit of a spoiler, so you probably already figured it out. But when an infant is being breastfed, the levels of bifidobacterium in the gut of the infant are um, higher. And then as breast milk is removed from the diet, you find a corresponding reduction in several of those different bifidobacterium species. And you can see that example here is a bifidobacterium brevi. So you might be asking, well, what's the major difference between something like a formula milk developed from bovine uh, milk compared to human, if human milk is so protective and formula is a risk factor for these diseases? So there's been a lot of work to extensively characterize the, uh, the complexity of human milk, and, and much of that work is still ongoing and, and has been for, for, for a long time now. But what we think is one of the major factors, at least from the microbiome standpoint, is these oligosaccharides. So I'll call these human milk oligosaccharides in the context of human milk or, or HMOs. And as you can see here, they're the third most abundant solid component of breast milk, and yet they're near enough absent from this bovine or, or formula milk. They're so abundant in human milk, they're actually more abundant than, than protein. And of course, we will all appreciate the importance of protein for an infant nutrition. 
yet these oligosaccharides provide no direct nutritional benefit to the infant. They actually reach the gut intact, so, so they, um, in the small and large intestine, feed the microbiome, so one of the primary roles is, is served as, as prebiotics. And so there's a lot of different uh, sugar structures, these HMO structures identified to date, just over 200 by last count. And you can see how, oh, we've lost the end, let's assume. Uh, you can see how as we move through these different uh, modifications, you can go from a lactose backbone into, in this case, lactoenteterose. And uh, through silylation, we can move to a DSLNT or disilactoenteterose. And this particular sugar is of huge interest to us, as, uh, uh, as I'll talk about in a few slides' time. And then through some of these other modifications, again, hopefully, you can see that the complexity of these sugars um, uh, and how they, they, they sort of build. And so this is a very active area of research currently, but we think the primary role, as I mentioned, is as a prebiotic and, and one of the potential mechanisms whereby breastfeeding modulates microbiome and then improves outcomes is by these bifidobacterium using these HMOs and releasing short-chain fatty acids as a byproduct. Short-chain fatty acids, as people in this audience I think will know better than me, have important immunomodulatory roles. So they can reduce inflammation, they can increase tight junctions and, and improve barrier integrity. And if we think about a preterm epithelium, uh, that becomes in incredibly important. They also potentially have roles in inhibiting pathogens and providing uh, binding with mucosal surfaces, and also potentially directly um, uh, immunomodulatory, but again, very much a, an, an active area of research currently. So at this point, I, uh, I moved back to Newcastle. I'm from Newcastle, as you could probably tell. I'm trying my best to do my posh Geordie accent, but I'm sure a bit of the Geordie has come through. Uh, so I'm, I'm back home now, and, and it, it really is a fantastic uh, city and, and university, and I'm, I'm very privileged to be able to work there. And I'm very privileged to be able to have built the team that I have over the last few years. I'll talk in particular today about analysis uh, of analysis that Andrea Massey has conducted and Lauren Beck, but we have a, a fantastically supportive team. And again, there's Andy and a special mention to Greg Young from Northumbria University, who is still very active in, in our preterm uh, research. So at this point, I'm, I'm back with Janet and Nick as well, the clinicians who sort of started it all for me. And we were thinking about what the next sort of st steps would be and, and building off of the work we'd done previously. We're obviously interested in bifidobacterium. We're interested in these sugars in breast milk. And so we, we had a look at the literature. And in NEC, there's not really much has been studied in the way of human milk oligosaccharides and necrotizing enterocolitis. But one investigator in particular, Professor Lars Bordet, based in UC San Diego, had done some really uh, fantastic work. So one of his publications, using a rat model of NEC, very nicely showed that those rats who were either formula-fed or formula-fed with GOS, which are basically linear, slightly less complex sugar structures than HMOs, uh, they found that the, the survival of those rats uh, um, was significantly reduced in that around 25% of, of the rats succumb to NEC. In the dam fed, so the equivalent of the sort of mother's own milk group in, in our cohorts, in our, in our human infants, none of those rats succumb to NEC. And then when we add the HMOs, or when Lars's team added the HMOs to the formula, they nicely showed that in most cases, all but one of those rats um, was protected against the, the development of NEC. So some nice evidence here that it, it may be protective. Lars's group then followed that up in a small clinical cohort of, of eight infants with neck, and in particular, Bell stage two and three, which is our most severe neck, they were able to show that this disilactoenteterose, or DSLNT, was reduced in those infants who went on to develop neck compared to matched controls. So again, some uh, really nice evidence that this is something that we should think about exploring. And in Newcastle, with the Great North Neonatal Biobank, of course, we're very well positioned to do that. And so Lars was one of the first people I spoke to about trying to set up a new project when I moved back, uh, and he's been fantastically support, supportive of that work and, and, and subsequent work. And so, as I mentioned, this particular section, the work I'll talk about, has largely been conducted uh, by Andrea, and she has a poster, uh, B188. Please go and uh, chat to her. There'll be a lot more within that that I won't have time to talk about today. So for this study, we collected, uh, used milk samples from the biobank of, of, of infants who went on to develop neck and, and matched controls, and we sent those off to Lars in America, who sent us back the HMO profiling data. So we then asked the question, is there a difference in the milk of infants who go on to develop neck compared to their matched controls? And as you can see here, there was a difference, and then the next step is to ask, what's driving that? And this is the only time, I think, in my career to date where the finding has very nicely reproduced some earlier work performed at a different time with a slightly different technique in a completely separate cohort. And that was the one thing driving that difference was DSLNT. And in our cohort, we also found that to be significantly reduced in our infants who went on to develop a neck. 
So Andrea did a bit of univariate modeling, determining that 241 nanomoles per mil was our optimal threshold for this cohort, at least in this population. We're working to validate that now. And you can see with that, we have an incredible sensitivity uh, specificity, or in other words, an incredible ability to predict neck in this population based on a single sugar in their mother's milk. But we're a microbiology lab, so we, of course, bring that back to the microbes and trying to build on this and, and understand a bit more about potential mechanisms. And so, again, we use the Great North Neonatal Biobank. In this study, we have around 650 stool samples, uh, which we perform metagenomic uh, sequencing on, in this case, from 14 NEC and uh, 34 matched controls. And once again, we use our clustering algorithms to determine these different preterm gut community types. Now we've changed sequence and approach. We uh, have five community types, and now we deliberately order these based on the earliest samples being in cluster one, and then uh, the latest samples were in community types four and five. And community types four and five were significantly, um, or the samples within community types four and five were significantly older or from more mature infants. Um, and we've done discriminatory analysis to, to support the, how the algorithms fit in these different um, clusters in the way that it has, and, and I'm just trying to show this visually here, but you can see as we expect that staff really dominates cluster one, and then as we get down into these clusters four and five, or community types four and five, you see bifidobacterium longum and bifidum being dominant in community type four, and bifidobrevi being uh, dominant in community type five. So the next question, of course, is so we've got these community types, we know DSLNT is important, but is DSLNT impacting the microbiome development in these infants at all? So here we have the infants who were above the DSLNT threshold, therefore largely controls. And as you can see, they, over time here, transition generally from that high staff group into either community types four or five, those bifidobacterium rich community types, which if evolution and our previous work is anything to go by is, is a good thing. And those infants who had breast milk, which was below the DSLNT threshold, you can see here, had much more perturbed development and much less sort of transition into those community types four and five. So a nice example of, of, of uh, going from a sort of human milk oligosaccharide, incorporating that with the microbiome, and, and, and again, much more work is now ongoing to try and unpick this potential mechanism a bit further. One such approach is to try and culture these different uh, isolates from preterm infants on these different sugars. And really, we're just following the methods that uh, many people have developed over the last uh, few years. In particular, uh, Lindsay Hall and her group have done some really fantastic work in term infants, published a couple of years ago in ISMI. And we're able to show that isolates from term infants uh, showed high strain-to-strain -strain variability in the way that they can use these sugars, and also that in many cases, these strains were able to use HMOs even though they had no known HMO utilizing genes. So there's still so much to be discovered uh, in this area. And we find very much the same pattern in our preterm infants. So we basically have three groups. We have our bifidobacterium group here, uh, and you can see bifidum is the only uh, isolate that we've tested so far that can use DSLNT. Uh, you can see B. infantis here all on its own. It's well known that B. infantis is an incredible utilizer of these sugars in milk, um, and that's been done some fantastic work out with David Mills's lab in, uh, in that regard. And then we have our group here in the middle, or, or what we consider our pathobion group. So these very abundant uh, microbes in preterm infants, but um, not able to use the sugars, and in some cases not able to use a lactose. So yeah, a lot of work still ongoing now, but, but this is all, all just stuff that we've been able to start uh, this year. So moving away slightly from um, preterm infants who go on to develop neck, and thinking about preterm infants who actually remain healthy or relatively healthy during their stay in intensive care, most infants won't develop neck and won't have any intestinal pathology. So healthy in this term basically means no, no intestinal pathology. And we want to understand how that microbiome develops and then potentially uh, at a later date feed that back towards disease outcomes. So we, like we had done with Teddy earlier, and I should mention this, is, this has been driven by, by Lauren uh, Beck, again, all really during lockdown. She's done fantastically well to come into the lab and pick up the computational skills and really drive the group forward in, in that regard. You might have already seen her present, hopefully you did, in the integrated omics session. It was a fantastic talk, but she'll also be around afterwards, and again, we'll be able to give you much more of an insight into this work than I'll have time to talk about today. So I expect she'll be around Andrea's poster, 188, if you want to go and chat. Um, please feel free to grab her. So we asked similar questions to Teddy, much like what are these major factors influencing microbiome progression, this time in an exclusive population of preterm infants. And things like birth mode, which in term infants we know to be um, very important, in preterm infants we, we don't see the same thing. 
But rather expectedly, I guess, probiotics did have a big impact. We introduced these on average on day eight, so around this point, and then from that time point onwards, you see probiotics are significantly impacting the development of the infant microbiome. On average, probiotics were stopped around day 40, so you can see continued impacts of probiotics long after the probiotics have stopped being administered. And this may extend into post-discharge as well, and so grab Lauren and she'll tell you more about the persistence and prevalence. But we're quite lucky in Newcastle that we have built this biobank over the last 12 years or so, and so we have timeframes of no probiotics and then the introduction of two separate probiotics. So if we take ourselves all the way back to 2013 and before, probiotics had never been used in the unit, and, in the unit, and this is kind of how the microbiome, this is the natural preterm microbiome development um, back then, largely transitioning into this Klebsiella, a dominant community type. The unit in 2013 introduced Infleran, which is a probiotic containing bifidobifidum and lactobacillus acidophilus, and in doing so, we shift the transition of the preterm microbiome towards this preterm gut community type 5, which is dominated in bifidobacterium brevi, which interestingly isn't part of, of Infleran. And then the unit introduced Labanic, which is a similar in makeup to Infleran. It contains, at least at the species level, different strains, but the same two species, as well as a, a, a B uh, infantis. And in doing this, we see the microbiome shifts toward uh, community type 4. So I think I was surprised to have two probiotics which were quite similar on the surface impacting the microbiome to such a, a large extent. But did this have any functional consequence? We think it probably does, and so we've done some metabolomics work. This is in collaboration with Ben Marsland in Monash University down in Australia, uh, who we send our stool samples to, 10 stool samples representing um, from each of these different community types, and Ben did untargeted metabolomics for us, and you can see here that the preterm gut community types are significantly linked to the small, the functional small molecules of the, the gut lumen. Um, but not of the serum, so we also had matched serum samples, and we don't find uh, the preterm gut community types are impacting uh, systemic uh, circulation or the metabolites in, 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 in the serum. So this is probably a gut lumen-specific phenomenon, which is nice for us because we have our gut model, um, and that allows us to, to really focus on the interaction at the epithelium sur uh, epithelial surface in, in the uh, small intestine. So that brings me nicely to the organoid work. Um, and so, yeah, this is something that I've been developing for a long time now, certainly the last seven or eight years of, 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 of my career. Um, and we're just really starting to, I guess, uh, see the rewards of, of that now with COVID passing, can get back in the lab and, and really, really start to build momentum with our, with our organoid work. For those unfamiliar, these intestinal organoids are, are derived from, in the case of preterm infants, resected tissue. We can do this with, with adult biopsies. And we basically isolate the stem cells from the base of the crypts in these samples, uh, and then we can grow these up in the lab, we can expand them indefinitely, um, we can freeze them down, revive them at a later date. And as you can see here, they can be differentiated into all the major cell types of the gut epithelium. So for instance, we would have goblet cells, which naturally secrete um, mucus in the gut. They're also patient-specific, so any epigenetic or genetic uh, predisposition to disease will be captured within this model system. But from a microbiology point of view, it's a non-trivial problem that these organoids require oxygen and then the anaerobes that colonize our lumen and our guts would be a largely anaerobic or facultative. And so this was a project I was fortunate to work with the Leng grad student Tatiana Forfanova on. And it was a really fun project, very different to anything I'd ever done before, very much on the bioengineering side. And um, we have now developed a system whereby we can diffuse oxygen into the media, which feeds the human organoid monolayer, but the cells themselves then consume all of that available oxygen for their survival, leaving the bacterial compartment or the apical compartment to be in its anaerobic environment because the whole system sits inside our, our very large anaerobic chamber. And so now we've got this built, we can use this to test various uh, hypotheses and build upon the associations of, of some of the work I've, I've talked about already. And really, before we even get to that point, we asked, is there a difference between these organoids derived from preterm infants compared to adults? And these are all ileum-derived uh, organoids. And you can see here, this is work that I actually started in America so many, many years, many years ago now, uh, which was finished by Andrea uh, here at New uh, since, since I joined Newcastle. We published this just uh, at the end of last year to show there is a difference, significant difference, in the gene expression between organoids derived from preterm infants and those derived from adults. In our most recent work in Newcastle, so performed by different researcher, different time, slightly different method, we continue to see that the biggest determinant of expression in these organoids 
is whether they were derived from a preterm or an adult. So again, I think for me, it lends a lot of weight to using an organoid system that's relevant to the population in which you're interested in, of course, in our case, that, that's preterm infants. And I won't talk about it today, I won't show it today, but just to mention the genes which were significantly differentially expressed between preterm and adults in both of these studies were remarkably similar and showed the same overall um, trend in expression. So I do think there's a lot of reproducibility in this system, and I think going forward, we can do some really important work to understand preterm uh, host in, and microbe interaction. So here's really just to whet the appetite because this work is very recent and was led again by Lauren and, and Andrea in my lab where we were trying to take this concept of preterm good community types forward and so we, we of course taxonomically have these five community types. We think functionally that's important but are those actually impacting on host response at all? So uh, Lauren basically designed a study where we um, pooled these samples that we had sent to Ben, filter sterilized them, and added them to, to the monolayer. So this is like first pass, just, just have a look and, and see if we find a difference in, in host response. And we certainly do for community types four and five, we find a, a very large difference in, their, in the way the organoid monolayers are responding to the metabolites and other immunomodulatory uh, components of those samples. So you can see here with 76 differentially expressed genes specific to community type 4. There's quite a lot shared between community types 4 and 5, which makes sense because they're both dominated by bifidobacterium. But in particular, community type 5 seems to have a very distinct response to the presence of these uh, functional components of, of community type 5. <laughs> So um, because this is a, a sort of early career award, I wanted to just outline a bit about what's coming next. I think I've mentioned as I've went through, but we're now thinking about trying to translate a lot of this work um, that Lawrence led in our healthy controls into understanding much more in depth in our neck population. And so unlike 10 years ago where we could only access around seven cases, we now have tens of neck neck cases who have gone through the unit and we have extensive sampling from those individuals so we can perform and build upon that earlier analysis to see how the microbiome is, is developing in those uh, um, in disease cases. We of course want to keep exploring our work around human milk oligosaccharides. We're doing some work with Lars at the moment to do that. We're also working uh, with Liz Lowe internally at Newcastle to see if we can develop a method that allows us to prospectively screen milk to see if we actually can real-time predict um, the, the risk of, of neck in this population. And of course, this has very obvious therapeutic potential as well as just biomarker potential. Uh, Leslie will be pleased to know if you were at her talk the other day that we are still doing uh, true microbiology. We're growing isolates in the lab. We have a large culture collection from the stool samples of our preterm infants, and we're growing these different isolates on human milk oligosaccharides, on, on other substrates, doing the genome sequence and doing the RNA sequence and trying to understand a lot more about the transcription. So, um, yeah, a lot more work to come from, from the microbiology. And, of course, in, in using our core culture model to try and unpick some of these mechanisms to add different microbes in combination with different HMOs to see how that's impacting the host uh, function, expression, tight junction, barrier integrity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to use the last few minutes of the talk just to thank a few uh, really key individuals uh, who have contributed, particularly since I moved uh, back to, to Newcastle. So the first is Lindsay Hall, who I think is here this evening and is just a fantastic human a, a role model, frankly, of mine, and has done some fantastic work, which we are really just trying to emulate. So uh, she's laid the path, and, and we're just trying to follow that. Uh, Lindsay's also been very supportive of me when I got back to Newcastle. I got on a call with Lindsay, she basically uh, suggested some of the funding I should apply for, helped me write some of those grants, and, uh, and, and that contribution has been invaluable, so I, I appreciate uh, that very much. And then to Alan Walker, who again I think will be familiar to many of you. When I moved back to Newcastle, I got asked, or I attended a PI development program and was suggested that I find somebody who was slightly outside my immediate area of interest, and this is a bit of advice to early career researchers as well, because it's paid off for me massively. Find someone outside your immediate uh, area of expertise, sort of five, ten years ahead of you, whose career you would like to sort of emulate. Alan uh, sprung to mind, he agreed, and so he's acted as my mentor over the last four years and has provided absolutely invaluable advice um, during critical moments and then during our, our sort of regular calls as well. So, so I, I'm very thankful to Alan. And then to Tracy and Jan, um, so Tracy Palmer and Jan Quinn are, are profs at Newcastle University and nominated me for this award. When Tracy reached out to me and asked if, if, if it's okay if she nominated me, I didn't know if she was joking or not, I was delighted but surprised and incredibly surprised to be standing here right now, it feels surreal. 
So this wouldn't be possible without, without Tracy and, and her support, and so I, I thank Tracy and Jan very much for, for their nominations. And frankly, if I can stand here and give this lecture, anyone who is eligible can. So to other members of the audience, please do nominate your trainees, because it's, it's, it's really privileged to be able to stand here this evening. And then just to name a couple of individuals from Newcastle, in James, Liz, and Kasia, and just, just have a bit of a shameless plug to Newcastle University. I'm, I'm biased, but it's a fantastic city and an incredible university, and the breadth of microbiology is phenomenal. And if you are interested in microbiology, which I suspect many of you are because you're here right now, really do consider Newcastle. If you're thinking about writing fellowships, come to Newcastle. We're always happy to support new people coming in. We have lectureships, PhD opportunities, postdoc opportunities, which you should really keep an eye on because not just within the medical field, but across the university, there's some incredible work going on, and it really is a melting pot for good science, and I get to go for a pint or a coffee with these guys, and the, some of the ideas we've come up with and have since started to test will be, I think, important in the years to come. My academic acknowledgements, my typical acknowledgements here, I think I've hopefully done a good job of thanking the various people as I've, I've moved through, but I can't thank Janet and Nick enough for all they've done for me over the last 12 years. They've made sacrifices to their own careers to really elevate mine, and those uh, sacrifices haven't gone unnoticed, so I'm incredibly appreciative of everything they've done. Of course, to the funders, particularly my current funders supporting the work I'm trying to build at Newcastle, and to our local and national charities around Nick, I, I, I play uh, important, um, very close linked to, to these charities. And lastly, just to the Microbiology Society, again, it's, it's a genuine honour to be able to talk to you all this evening, and I'm pretty relieved it's done now so I can get a pint of Guinness, but it has, uh, it's been a fantastic bit of recognition, and it, it does reflect the whole team. So, so thank you again, and thank you to all coming out this evening. Thanks. Christopher, thank you for such a brilliant lecture and fascinating insights. Um, it gives me great pleasure to present you with the, the Fleming Prize Certificate. 